enjoy the present, because in 100 years, probably everything you do will be wiped away, right? So um, let's hope not. We celebrate the history and the Friends of Old Anvil. This map details where some locations were. Maybe some of you have family that lived in this area or worked around here in the 1870s. Something interesting to explore. There's a little dash line in the middle of the, lap of the map. That's where Clear Spring Road would shift to around the 1910s when the Millard family was establishing the mansion and this carriage house built in 1911. So let's talk a little bit about the Millards who bought the quarry from Joseph Kreider about uh, 1890s. And this, again, was a father, Jacob Millard, and his son, Harry. Now, Jacob had a quarrying business in northern Lebanon. So he was familiar with, with the ropes and thought, let's get my son established. He purchased Kreider's property and set Harry up. Harry E. Millard would work here and operate this place until his death in 1950. And when you leave this carriage house, look up, you'll find this strange insignia. If you know that it was built in 1911, for the work of Harry E. Millard, you'll be able to discern what the mess is of that insignia and how, what it signifies. So give yourself that quiz as you walk out today. When uh, the Millard family took over, well, they ex expanded the business by hiring a lot of folks internationally. And from the 1890s to the 1900s, if you scan the Lebanon Daily News, you'll see article after article of dozens of people coming, not only from Italy, but also from Hungary to work here in the quarry. And in your booklet, you have a picture then from the 1910s of some Italian immigrants working there. There were a lot of accidents, as you might expect. You're dealing with blasting rock, but there's also a lot of employment opportunity provided. And in the wintertime, when the, thing, when the quarry would fill up with water, well, we could open it up to the community and have some ice skating parties. Look at those folks in their fine wear, ice skating around the 1910s. Turn the page, you'll see a beautiful picture of Millerden when it was built around 1911. What's one striking difference between this picture and what we see today when we drive to Walmart from Anvil? What do you notice that's different? That beautiful wraparound porch with the supporting wall of limestone, it really... Uh, does something to skirt the building now. It looks a little bit bare without it, but oftentimes porches would rot and need to be removed. We see that in uh, historic buildings throughout Handel. The operations are pictured down below around the 1940s. You see that building used to say Millard uh, limestone right on the side of it. You can still see that when you drive by. What drove this great success was the practically pure calcium carbonate that was pulled from this area. Very, very unusual deposit of calcium carbonate right here that made this a, a wealth of uh, resources so that we can read in the middle of the page between the postcard about the products and the ruler that you might get as a souvenir for visiting. It says that the Millard Company was the single largest capacity for turning out lime east of the Mississippi River was Lebanon County's white gold right here. And so uh, they built the world's most modern lime plant. Look at that. And the ruler, it says, ready to serve you after the war. So when might that ruler be from? The 1940s, right? Great. Because of the wonderful success they had as the primary producers east of Mississippi, the Millard family was able to expand their interest. At this point, they owned land south of 422, north of 422, and they did all kinds of interesting things with it. Primarily among them was the breeding of purebred Angus cattle. If you turn the page, you can see the farm there, Millerden Farms. Drive to Walmart today, look to your left if you're traveling west, and you'll see that structure still stands. And the, uh, the letters have been taken down, but you can still see where it used to say, Millerden Farms. In there were housed and uh, sold these purebred Angus cattle to people from around the United States. They had really quite a fine operation. Imagine these large, beautiful brown cattle roaming all over that uh, uh, field there. And the inside of the barn looked like this, where they would bring the cattle out to people from Connecticut, people from Mississippi, from Kentucky, come to, up to buy 
the cattle there in the showroom. Matter of fact, there is a very famous person, a president of the United States, came to buy an Angus cattle from the Millard family. What president was that? Anybody can tell me? Eisenhower. Eisenhower, Eisenhower everybody knows. In 1954, <laughs> Eisenhower came out and bought uh, two cattle, and uh, we'll, you'll see the picture of that later. Other interests they had were thoroughbred horses, and the, again, the Millard family had exceptional success with thoroughbred horses. A horse named Injun Joe, you can read about at the top of the next page, participated in the U.S. Olympic team in the 1940s. Another horse, all afire, was in the U.S. National Jumpers Championship, celebrated a couple years in Madison Square Garden. So some of the pictures, you'll see the family there, Madison Square Garden, receiving their awards. That's when they're all dolled up in their tuxes. Not only did they have thoroughbred horses and their cattle, they also continued the flower operation. See that at the bottom of the page? And if you turn the page, you see they had an airport. This family did so well, they didn't just have an airplane. They had a whole airport right here in Anvil, south of 422. Who here remembers the airport in Anvil? All right, several of us do. Anybody flying a plane out of Anvil's airport? A couple of people did, maybe. All right. Uh, wonderful. And we have a lot of aerial pictures from the Millard family. They were taken while they were flying around town. See a picture of the airport there. And below, you see Harry Millard's personal interest was hunting. And he had a trophy room in the mansion right here, just filled with lions tigers, and bears, oh my. <laughs> if you enter the mansion from the entrance now, you take a left, the first door on your left was the trophy room, that's what's pictured here. They would tell the, the housekeepers, the healthcare providers that would come to the, to the mansion to be careful because the door didn't latch quite right. And uh, if you were to open that door, you might get scared out of your pants because there would be a bunch of bears growling at you. Well, Harry Millard died in 1950, and his daughter, Laura Millard, married a man who took over the operations named E.D. Williams. And you see a picture of their family in the next page of your booklet. Laura and E.D. are in the middle with their three sons, Jack, E.D. Jr., and Harry Millard Williams. We'll talk a little bit more about Harry later, but you see E.D. there with the beautiful truck taking over the operations at the bottom of that page. Turn the page and you'll see Eisenhower buying his two cattle. We have some nice pictures of that eventful visit. And the next picture tells you a little bit more about the Millard family son, Harry Millard Williams. Now, when you're a member of such a successful family with so many resources, why not give it a shot and see if you can't make it big in Hollywood? That's what Harry Millard Williams thought. Took the stage name Harry Millard and went to Hollywood to find some success. Who here has seen the show Voyage to the Bottom of the Sea? Anyone seen that? Remember seeing it? Popular back in the 1950s and 60s, right? Harry Millard Williams played the spy in a famous episode about a Russian who had infiltrated a submarine and was hiding there with the Americans and spying on them. So the spy was played by Anvil native Harry Millard Williams. <coughs> he went on to, to play in a lot of these 1960s race cars uh, movies, and you'll find some of them listed on the far right of that picture. They were shown here in Lebanon to celebrate his role in that. And if you go to Facebook, search Friends of Old Anvil, you find some links to some fun trailers from the 1960s about uh, these B-grade movies. But Harry Millard was not always in B-grade. He ended up with a contract at Universal. He was a director of a movie that had some well-known actors in it. They're from the 60s, so I don't know them, but you would, maybe. Uh, the contract was going strong. The movie was in production when Harry got struck by an awful disease that put him in the hospital for three years, after which time he died. So uh, that contract dissolved, the movie was never produced, and Anvil's connection to Hollywood ends thus. We almost made it. All right, that's a little bit about Harry Millard. Back to the quarry here. As the Williams uh, managed the operations, they sold off all the pieces of it individually. So the airport, uh, the cattle, everything was either discontinued or sold off, including the quarry, which was sold to Bethlehem Steel, who operated it from 1966 to 1988 because limestone 
is a part of the production of steel. And maybe some people who are here worked at Bethlehem Steel at this location from 1966 to 1988. Anybody here fit that category? There's one, somebody, anybody else? No? All right, we've had several throughout the day. Not only them, but their parents and their grandparents. There's a long heritage of folks working here. In time, as uh, steel production dropped off, Bethlehem Steel would sell this operation to Broyhill and Associates, who sold it to a national company called Wimpy Minerals USA. Wimpy poured $20 million into this place, adding many of the conveyor belts that you see. There's 10 miles of them, and really refining the process. So on this page, it says Wimpy Minerals. We can read a little bit about the process of mining limestone. So it says that we start by drilling 55 feet down with these bits that are five and a half inches in diameter. Dig down and fill that with explosive, set it off, and you get all your rock pieces you can then crush and use for a variety of products. The last sentence of the third paragraph on that page says that fired limestone is central to the production of mortar, paper, glass, steel, and toothpaste. Next time you use your toothpaste, you might think about the folks here at Penzi Supply and how they're helping that bring that to you. All right, the next page talks a little bit about the scope of the operation, which is impressive. 3,000 acres of property are here. It goes 500 feet deep. It's three miles long and half a mile wide. Quite expansive. There's 125 conveyor belts, 10 miles of conveyor belt here. After Wimpy did all their improvements, they sold the operations to Tarmac. It was then purchased by a national company called Carmoose, which then sold to Penzi. But Carmoose is still here because they lease from Penzi. So Penzi is the owner. Carmoose is like a tenant. And um, uh, they work together to get the most that they can from both limestone and uh, a a high, uh, low-grade form of limestone, dolomite. All right, let's look at these final color pictures. Aren't they impressive to show you the size? If we look at this top picture, you'll see in the upper right-hand corner two large white buildings. Can anybody tell me what are those large white buildings? Walmart, Walmart. Walmart and Lowe's. That's Walmart and Lowe's. So think about how big those buildings are, and then look at that quarry. You get a sense for the size of it, it's immense. The bottom picture is taken from the west-hand side. You can find Walmart and Lowe's there, as well as the London Dairy Shopping Center. Look how dwarfed they are in comparison to that mining operation with the, they call it the benches, or the terracing, going down 500 feet into the pit. There's a road that runs through that terracing. That's what we were gonna drive down today, but because of the rain, we weren't able to do that. Uh, takes you down to the bottom of uh, the quarry there. It's interesting to think about water and the quarry. There is an awful lot of water that's pumped out because there's groundwater always flowing into this particular quarry in addition to rainwater that might settle there. So uh, it's, they say about, am I right, 8 million gallons a day is pumped around perhaps depending on the season, right? And, uh, and so Penzi Supply was kind enough a month ago to give a tour to folks in the Quidipahilla Watershed Association who are wondering about silt and output and how all this water, where it ends up. We had a, about a, two hours here. They explained to us why it is the silt levels are actually improving because Penzi recirculates much of that water in the operation of the processing of the limestone. Uh, a very small percentage is actually put out into Killinger Creek, and that which is put out has been filtered and is quite clean uh, so that uh, we don't have significant environmental concerns. The folks at the, at the Watershed Association were actually encouraged at the end of the time. Today, uh, if we look at this last picture one more time, you'd see there's a train tracks just to the south of it. On uh, the northern side, there's a wall of mineral that is not limestone. And so this quarry is nearing the end of its life. 
And so we have the berm along State Route 422, and there will be some digging in that area just north of State Route 422 uh, to form a new quarry. Penzi estimates that the work and the resources available there are going to last for the next 100 years. So we'll, uh, we're looking forward to having Penzi continue their work and uh, their, pro their production in this area for some time to come. Uh, I, I think now I'll stop talking and we can maybe have some questions. Eric Snowatsky is here from Penzi Supply. If you have questions about their operation, I'm here. If you have questions about the history, maybe there's some comments you guys have. What would you like to say? Yeah, Richard. Uh